right, <laughs> welcome to New Tino on this Monday morning, 9.30. Um, I can see we have uh, some new people in the room and some people who joined us a while ago as well. Uh, welcome to everyone. Great to see you. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Always nice to see familiar faces again. Um, because there are some newbies in the room, quickly, the rules of the game are we... Um, Everyone is welcome. Uh, bring a paper that got you excited for whatever reason. Tell us about the paper and what got you excited about it. And then we have a discussion to the best of our knowledge and everyone is welcome. Wow, you're coming close, Abby. <laughs> everyone is welcome to um, ask their questions. Um, and that's basically it. Those are the rules. Um, for those of you who want to present a paper, just uh, let me know in advance or just join the session and then just copy the link in the chat as Michelle has just done. Thank you very much. And then share your screen and just talk about the paper. So that's it, really. Uh, I can see we have one paper in the chat for today. So I'm happy to give the floor to you, Michelle. Take it away. Hello, hello, hello. I'm going to share my screen. Can you see the digital brain bank and open access platform for postmodern data sets? We can, but can you zoom in a little bit so it's full screen? How about like this? Thanks. Um, all right. So, you know, as you know, we live at the ages of open science. And if you have a data set that you could share, but you decided not to share, uh, with the community. This is a waste in science because a lot of people could actually make great discoveries with uh, the time that you spent acquiring those data, especially when they are unique, like the data that I'm going to present to you that are part of the digital brain bank. This is an initiative uh, uh, from uh, this bunch of authors and like the uh, senior authors of this paper, Asaj Babdi, Roger Mars, and Carla Miller who are from Oxford, good friends of us, actually. Um, so during the last 10 years, I spent a long time acquiring postmodern imaging, particularly diffusion weighted imaging of uh, postmodern brains from different species. Um, and the purpose here was to create an online library where people can download the raw data and start um, building new scientific uh, results and making new scientific investigation for free. Um, this database include a high resolution uh, human with uh, diffusion MRI and polarized light imaging of different uh, brain structures. As uh, a diffusion weighted imaging of the human is a world brain diffusion MRI of the entire brain. It means uh, 500 microns, one and two, millime two millimeters, combined with a structural MRI and a quantitative T1 and T2 map. Uh, and so this is just a normal human brain. And on the side of that, you also have some uh, polarized light imaging of the entire commissure, the corpus callosum, the pons, the thalamus, and the visual cortex in the same brain. And those, this material have been previously published, as you can see here. You have a second data set, which is uniquely uh, polarized light imaging. And that's a polarized light imaging. It's a sagittal slice. If you've seen the lecture from Carla Mila that she gave uh, recently, she's showing a, a work with polarized light imaging. She shows this, uh, this wonderful, I think, it, I think it's a coronal actually slice. No, it must be a sagittal slice of the uh, corpus callosum where you can see really the fiber organization, fiber organization like 500 microns. Um, uh, Sorry, so the diffusion MRI of this extra brain with a, a four micron in plane resolution and polarized light imaging of the corpus skeleton. Four micron is interesting because we almost can see uh, single uh, fibers. And they added like a, a couple of extra um, histological staining to this acquisition, as you can see it. Uh, as you can see here, immunochemistry stains for myelin and astrocytes, okay? It's been previously published in that paper. 
And that will be the digital anatomist part of uh, the uh, database that they make available. Uh, you have a second part, which is called the digital brain zoo, where you can actually explore the brain with diffusion weighting imaging at a high resolution of uh, different species. Uh, and so you have, as I said, diffusion MRI and uh, you also have structural MRI of the Amadrias baboon, the baboon, the chimpanzee, the tamarind, another kind of tamarind, the macaque monkey, the lemur, and the gorilla. And they've all been acquired with high resolution. Outside of the non-human primate uh, species, you also have some uh, marsupials with the Tasmanian devil and the Tilasin, which I'm not sure what a Tilasin is, but pretty sure it's a marsupial. You have some uh, cetacean uh, species. You have the common dolphin and the pantropical dolphin. Uh, you have the European wolf. And you have a last part of this online database, which is called the digital pathologist, where they plan to upload a high resolution imaging of brain with specific pathologies. And they started here with uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, post-mortem uh, imaging, where you have 12 human brain with this disease and you have three control brain with the same acquisition. So you can make some, uh, some comparisons. I assume uh, that the control brain are matching age and education. Um, well, then the results are pretty much what I'm saying. There is this nice illustration here that they, that they used to demonstrate that actually most of the problems that we have done with tractography will be solved with the improvement of uh, resolution. So if you take polarized light imaging as a uh, um, gold standard for tractography, you see how fibers come inside. This is a gyrus, okay? Uh, you see how the fibers are coming here and project laterally on the entire surface in the depth of the gyrus. Well, now, if you do that with two millimeter tractography, it looks terrible. It's just going there and then like it's a complete mess inside the gyrus. If you do it at one millimeter, which is uh, 70 uh, data from the HCP uh, equivalent, uh, you see that you're starting to recover the organization of this fanning of white matter connections. And if you do it at 500 micron, you see that you really start to have something that look like actually the organization of real fibers. Um, and so it's kind of a good news because um, kind of thought like we won't solve that problem before we reach a micron in terms of resolution for diffusion, but 500 micron looks like it will be possible one day to do it in the living human brain and no expense with the improvement of technology. So yeah, hey, science solving one problem at a time. Um, and they show also in terms of uh, RGB maps or color map, I forgot how they call it in Oxford. Um, um, they don't call it RGB maps, they have like uh, another, another term, I think it's FIFA or something like that. Anyway, uh, so you see when you're doing tractography at two millimeters, a map on which you're doing tractography with the orientation of diffusion look like this. This is uh, the pulse actually. So you get like these little blue dots over here that should be a uh, 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 part of uh, um, inferior superior fibers. And you get like some of those red dots that are supposed to be left right fibers here and those those fibers over here frequently your tractography is going to link it together and go from one cerebellum to another cerebellum and that's actually not correct because it's supposed to cross and when you get to one millimeter you see it crossing over here a little bit but tractography is blind and we'll carry on showing you mostly fibers are going from right to left. And if you go at 500 micron, then you start having like a clear resolution of what's happening here and the pons, and you can see all those beautiful fibers in the organization. Again, the same goes for the internal capsule where you see like those blue fibers here, they will be going from inferior to superior. 
um, the uh, pink fibers here, they will be going laterally and the green fibers will be going anteriorly. And, um, but this is, you know, this is a blurry mess that we have here. And so if we go to higher resolution, we start seeing uh, stripes over here. Uh, it's because the organization of the fibers is not as smooth as you can see here. And when you go to 500 micron, you actually see that there is a division and stripes in the internal capsule in the organization and the orientation of the fibers. Um, and this is this is comparable to what you can see with polarized light imaging at a high resolution. Well, they did this nice evolutionary tree, so you can uh, put things in uh, perspective with a uh, human at the top, as we should be. And then you have uh, other um, uh, non-human primate species over here. And so, like the for those of you who don't know, the evolutionary tree is a long tree, and branches separate as species get divided a long time. And this line over here represents millions of years and how we separated from gorilla, baboon, macaque monkeys, and so on and so forth. Um, this is an example of a little bit of the histologies that they have for the uh, pathological database that they make available. So you can look at MRI and all of ways like look in parallel at uh, histological imaging and make comparisons. And um, that's about it for the paper. I think it's a great initiative and uh, they will fill this database with time with more and more data. And I think, you know, it's great because they're gonna allow us to, um, instead of uh, spending a lot of money and time trying to acquire data with always the risks that not having the optimal parameters or problem with the acquisition here, we can just focus on scientific question and try to uh, uh, decipher um, the cause and the origin of either evolution, anatomy, or pathologies. Thank you, that's it for me. Thank you very much, Michelle. Are there questions in the room? No, not yet. Okay, they might come with time. Um, very, very nice study indeed, and a great resource to come. Um, so you get really excited that we might be able to solve the resolution problem sooner rather than later. How long do you think it will take until we get a comparable resolution in the living brain? Uh, I don't know. Uh, this, yeah, this is a factor eight uh, decrease resolution. So with uh, HCP, P70, they were able to do one millimeter acquisition. Here, yeah, that's 500 microns, so it's like that's eight times smaller. Um, 10 years. That's bad. pretty soon. But we'll see. I'm, I'm doing a bet here. It's recorded, it's on YouTube. I'll say in 10 years from now, we'll have in vivo 500 micron diffusion weighted imaging. <laughs> data sets available for fun. I'll set a reminder, I'll come back to you in 10 years on this. All right, all right. <laughs> we are with flying cars. So, uh, you also mentioned that um, it's an open resource and more data will be added to it. Um, can anyone chip in data or will they just fill it up over time? That's a good question. I, I don't know, I assume so because um, this is already this is already a database made of uh, data that are coming from uh, from different collaborators. Uh, I guess if we have a an awesome data set and we want to put it in there, they'll be happy too. But it's just a matter of like contacting contacting them and uh, making it available. That's it. Thank you. There's a question in the chat, I think. What factors, reasons encourage scientists to study postmortem brains and not living brains? Um, so like, first reason, they, they don't complain. And that's uh, 
that, that's a very good reason to study post-mortem brain. Uh, second reason, you can have way higher uh, spatial resolution with, compared to the living. Uh, and the third reason is you can have uh, histological postmodern measurement, real biology on your sample, uh, because I never stress that enough, but there is a gap between what we do with MRI and what actually truly is biology that is also often assumed to be equivalent, but but in real, it's, you know, it's not that sure, it's not that clear. You can also scan for way longer scanning periods, <laughs> like days. Some, you can't uh, do that with a living brain. You can, you can. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not days, but, you know, several hours. The only problem is uh, you cannot do functional MRI. No, it would be very hard to ask this participant to do a neuropsychological task or to speak. <laughs> I actually tried doing resting state on a post-mortem brain and then uh, gave it to analysis to someone who was completely blind to the fact that it was post-mortem to see yeah. if we can uh, recreate a, the dead salmon experiment. I, I, I don't know if that person was me, but at one point I received this data set being blind that the brain was dead and I was like, something's wrong with that brain. <laughs> it was actually you and Leonardo in the end, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, all right. Uh, yeah, there was nothing coming up. It's not like the brain of the dead fish, you should have done resting state in a dead fish. Those fish got extra brain life. But like cats who have seven lives, fish have yeah. seven brain lives. Yeah. Great. Are there any other questions? Yes, yes Chris. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, sorry. Um, uh, with this uh, post-mortem data set, do you think? Uh, well, I, I don't know if it already exists, but do you? Uh, 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 did you see papers using postmortem to enhance the the resolution or make better prediction uh, on actual data sets? So, like as we use the uh, tractography of healthy uh, patients, uh, healthy participants to enhance the results of a stroke patients. That's a very good point. Um... No, I think the limitation for that is like as we're getting into smaller structure and smaller details, there is more inter individual variability. So, you, you know, you can use it like for some models, like the projection of, of fibers inside a gyrus. And I think Sash Babli is working really hard on this. Um, but you cannot use it like as a as a strict rule for everything. Otherwise, you cancel out like individual differences. Uh, but ideally, when they have more brains, uh, postmodern with diffusion, we should totally process it and put it in the disconnectome. Yeah. Very high resolution. <laughs> that would be awesome. Yeah. Sorry, Evie, you had a question as well. Yes. Um, no, just uh, so. I was wondering, so um, we saw this uh, conference about the Shononso project. I think it's a competitive project of this one. Uh, um, so just uh, some questions about it um, compare, uh, when we compare the two projects. The first is all these are uh, the human brain uh, of the subject uh, scan uh, for this um, high resolution diffusion MRI. Yes, that's the entire brain. So this is the entire, but the, the age, the age of the subject, is it the older guy? How, uh, who was it collected? Uh, that's, that's a good question. Um, di -ba -di -ba -di, ba -di -ba -di -ba um, I don't remember. That must be mentioned in the studies that have been using it. Look at that. You will find this information could move your faces up. Uh, diffusion around processing described here. Data set described in this publication, methodology in supporting information. It's been lazy and uh, 
I'm busy as well, so I didn't look at the su supplementary material. Shame on me. There is uh, a about that it's really well done if you want to check it out. Sorry? No, there is not. I was able to put a website that I shared in the chat. Ah, you can see the. That, yes, um, there are all the links and all the publications. There are three pages I can share. You want to share it? Okay. Ah, I can. I cannot share. Okay. I will look at it. So basically, it's a, oh, I'm pretty sure it's an old guy. So it's not a young. So that will be maybe an issue when uh, looking at the comparing what you got from. So we are used to scan adults and not aging people. So that can be a problem when you, you compare the, the anatomy of uh, the, not the population, but comparing the, the age of the subjects. Yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, that could be uh, that could be an issue. So big difference with also like here, like the data are like really available now. Yeah, you just make a request next day, you have the data. I don't know for the other initiative. Yeah, we discussed about it. So normally it should be available, but uh, I check it. It's not yet, and there is an embargo. I think yeah, the resolution is great. It's uh, the other one is two hundred micro, and I mm -hmm. think uh, yes. And uh, yeah, and you reply to one of my questions. So this brain was scanned entirely. So it's not cut because the Shinoso uh, project has, uh, I decided to do the osteological part to uh, cut the brain in different parts. Uh, this one is, it's a whole brain, not cut it off, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah, do you wanna uh, talk us through the website a little bit? Oh, no, I know, I was checking out no the website it's, so you can there are previews that you can have for example here you can uh, there is uh, the fa maps the md of uh, the same slice so you can see in all the different uh, modalities uh, how it's like and um, what i was noticed is that uh, you can also find the pre-processed uh, uh, data um uh, here, ball and rockets. I don't know the rockets, but in the um, here in the digital brain tool, usually you don't have the. Uh, maybe you can request that, but here you don't have the uh, diffusion MRI raw data, but the pre-processed uh, map so using the ballistic uh, model um, in uh, bed post six, uh, and then you can uh, run the tractography, I guess, with frog tractor uh, in the Oxford Library. And also diffusion tensor map. Um, it's really nice here the zoom um, page. I never seen all these speed. Like maybe it's just me, but I didn't see it. And uh, yes, and last uh, the digital pathology that it's really like um, so uh, as Michelle showed in the paper. It's really we follow the paper structure and the table that we saw before here in the web. But so it's really nice because you can really the in images and details uh, the paper um, um, data stuff. So this is the website here. Thank you, Leah. Uh, very interesting. Just uh, I might need to look into this a bit more. But how is this different to other groups who are collecting um, postmortem brains from zoos already and have many different species? So you have the brain catalog, uh, that is a great initiative from Roberto Toro, but they only have T1 MRIs, they don't have, they don't have like a diffusion weighted imaging. And that's the main difference. Didn't then, Yanif Asaf collect diffusion imaging in mm -hmm. so? So like the resolution is much lower with Yanif Asaf and the data are not available. But you can send him a nice email and he will share some of the data, but it, it, they're not available as a well. Okay, thanks. It's nice to know what the difference is. We also had another question in the chat, and that is, are there exclusion criteria for donor brains? So, uh, so like like one of the one of the criteria that is essential for you to give your brain is to be deceased. That's that's an important uh, that's an important one. 
Um, another exclusion criteria is like you need to be dying in, in a condition that didn't destroy your brain. So gonna avoid like traumatic brain injury, for example, uh, any smashing or car accident or anything like that is uh, prescribed, prescribed, not a good idea. Um, and this is mainly because like the structure of the brain is going to be damaged, so you cannot really use it to uh, draw like conclusion or inferences about the anatomy of the brain. Then usually, uh, you know, if you're going as a control for the pathological group, uh, exclusion criteria will be for you to be, uh, to have had a diagnosis of a, a neurological condition, psychiatric condition. That's really nice. Yeah, that's really, really nice. Um, um, and uh, if you're in the pathological group, like the inclusion criteria will be that you actually have the pathologies that you're supposed to have. And that's, that's about it. Most importantly, you need to give consent whilst you're still alive. Of course. Or in some country, didn't feel the form saying that you didn't want to give your body to science, which no comment, it's kind of fucked up, but yeah. Chris, you got a question? No, he oh. just didn't lower his hand. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, any other questions? Did I miss anyone? Let me just check the chat. No. YouTube is also happy. I think that's it for today. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for presenting this wonderful paper, Michelle. And we see you again next Monday morning, 9.30 for the next Neurochino. And until then, have an exciting week in science. Bye. Every day I fit my brain.